Hey, uh, before I get started, I think I'm going to have a few minutes to spare. Um, I, I don't know if, if all of you could tell, oh, but when we did baptisms over here, the, the second young uh, lady that was baptized, I don't know if you noticed, but there was like 10 kids her age that just ascended upon the baptistry. Um, and if you're like me, which hopefully you're not, but if you're like me, it's easy to get down about what you see happening in the world around us. But man, I'm holding on to that picture this morning. Um, because when kids run to see their friends symbolize their faith in Jesus Christ, I get this crazy suspicion that we might be all right. We really might. And so, man, that was, uh, that was enough for what I paid to come in this morning at least. Yeah. Um, so, now for the sermon. All right. Hey, uh, which by the way, I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving um, and all that good stuff. Sincerely, I do. But we are, uh, we are past Thanksgiving and we are excited to step into a new series called Encountering God. And the idea of this series is that we are going to look at some of those people who first encountered God on that first Christmas and see how we might be able to gain a better understanding of how we can encounter God by sort of looking at their lives. And so we're going to go through kind of the different characters of the nativity, right? We'll talk about Mary next week with, with Gary, and then we'll talk about the shepherd, the wise men. But I have the privilege this morning uh, of sort of kicking us off with Joseph, right? And so Joseph, uh, for all intents and purposes, is the earthly father of Jesus. Now, before we talk about Joseph, I want to talk about this guy named Jesse Hyman. Now, Jesse Hyman is one of the most active people in Hollywood. He's been in over 150 different projects, ranging from film, television, commercials. Uh, he is widely considered to be the world's greatest extra of all time. And I think we have a picture of him. You might recognize him. There you go. Okay, kind of goofy looking dude, but he is the world's greatest extra. Now, if you don't know what an extra is, an extra is simply someone who's in a scene to make the scene feel more realistic and authentic. For instance, if you're shooting something at a ballpark, you wouldn't want to have the lead actor and actress, let's say, in an empty stadium because that would not make the scene seem very realistic. So instead, you pay a bunch of people very, very minimal wage and they come and sit in the stadium, therefore bringing more realism to the scene at hand. No speaking parts, no glory. They don't go to the premiere. They don't walk the red carpet. Nobody really knows who they are unless you do it 150 times. And the reason I talk about Jesse Hyman, because in my own life, and, and don't let me uh, portray this on any of you, but in my own life, I often kind of view Joseph as sort of just like an extra in the nativity, in the Christmas story. And it's, it's really easy to do if you think about it because he doesn't have any recorded lines in Scripture. He doesn't say a word. But despite it being easy to sort of shove him off to the side for people like Mary and the shepherds and the wise men, I think as we'll look at today, there is a ton that we can glean from the life of Joseph and how he encountered Jesus, better positioning us to encounter Jesus this year. And so I'm really, really excited about this, and I hope you are too. You just heard Chandler read the scripture, but I just want to walk through it this morning, point out a couple things about how we can encounter God through looking at how Joseph encountered God, and then we'll call it a day. Verse 18 says this, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. So, Joseph and Mary are in this season called betrothal, okay? Now, betrothal is, is more or less kind of how we would view engagement, but historically, it was a year-long season, and at least from what I read in one commentary, the primary purpose of this season was to test the fidelity of a relationship before they sort of tied up the knot. And so it was essentially a pressure test. Now, Joseph at this point in the passage, he doesn't know all that's going to happen. And so from his perspective, right here in verse 18, Mary has just badly failed this test of betrothal, right? She is found to be pregnant. And, and I think we often jump sort of past verse 18, and instead we don't stop to think about the agony 
and the burden that Joseph would have been feeling. I mean, this would have been a tough, tough place to be. Having to grapple with the unfaithfulness, the infidelity of his fiance. And he is essentially presented with three options, right? And he kind of talks about these options in this passage. But the first one is he could essentially retaliate and he could expose her. He could publicly disgrace her. It might even lead to her being stoned to death, put to death through stoning. The second is he could just kind of carry on and remain engaged and then get married to her. The problem with this option, though, is it would break the Mosaic law. You can read about that in Leviticus 20.10 if you are so bored or if my sermon is that bad. The third, the third is he could privately divorce her, right? He could do things the quiet way, kind of under the radar, and this is what he chooses to do, right? This is what he chooses to do in verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And I think this is fascinating because, again, this is the really, if you think about it, this verse 18 and 19 right here, this is the only picture of Joseph we have before things sort of drastically change in his life. And he learns that, you know, his wife or his fiance is going to give birth to the Messiah. But before Joseph knows any of that, we can already see that Joseph is a man of high honor and high faithfulness. He is going to honor Mary. And he's going to be faithful to the Mosaic law. And if there's ever been anyone to take the high road, this is it. Joseph is it. You ever think, you know, if, if you ask someone, um, maybe a, a spouse, a family member, a sibling, a coworker, if you could describe me in one word, what one word would you use? And for Joseph, it's got to be faithful. Joseph is a man of deep, deep faithfulness and steadfast. It continues in verse 20. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So Joseph, he's made his decision. He's going to quietly and privately divorce her. And then some amount of time passes. We don't know how long. I think we could assume it was probably less than nine months, if you know what I'm saying. But some amount of time passes after he had considered this and he has this dream, right? And what is the first thing that the angel of the Lord commands or tells Joseph? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now, we typically tell someone to not be afraid for one of two reasons. One is because they are visibly frightened, right? The other is because what we're about to tell them is going to make them visibly frightened. And so we're kind of throwing out a precaution. You're like, hey, don't freak out, but blah, blah, blah. And, and I think both of these are probably at play for Joseph. Of course, he's, he's scared. Life as he saw with Mary, growing old with her, has been totally upended. But I also think the angel has given him the precautionary, do not be afraid, because look at what the angel is about to tell Joseph, take Mary home as your wife. Break the law. Break the Mosaic law. And it's at this moment, you just picture this in your head, Joseph's jaw had to have just dropped. Like, what? You just said you're an angel of the Lord, and the next thing you tell me is to break the law of the Lord. You're either a really bad angel or this is way different than what I was expecting you were going to say, right? But break the law. Break the law. And yet the beautiful thing about this is that the first thing that the Lord through this angel does is seek to comfort. And what we know is that the origins of this child is from the Holy Spirit. And in the same way, when we know that we are in a situation, in a place, in a conversation, and we know that we are being prompted to do something, to say something, to take a step, when we can trust that the origins are from the Lord, fear has no place. Fear has no place. And I think Joseph shows us that. Joseph shows us that he doesn't have to fear breaking the law because the origin of what is happening here is from the Lord and from the Holy Spirit. So when we encounter the Lord, we don't have to fear what is from him. Verse 21 continues. 
She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And you can just picture at this point, the wheels have to be turning in Joseph's head, right? Perhaps even while Joseph is hearing this, he's recalling what he would have been taught in Jewish first century Sunday school, and maybe he's starting to even remember Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This had to have been a revolutionary moment for Joseph. This had to have been the moment where he says, oh, I think I see what's happening here. I think I'm beginning to understand that my wife being impregnated through the Holy Spirit is something much, much bigger than what I originally thought. And at this moment, Joseph knows that the one who is going to save the world from their sins is being knit together in the womb of his, fa- of his fiance. And Joseph's desire for faithfulness to the Mosaic law took him from a faithfulness in something, in a story that was much, much larger. And when we encounter Jesus, we begin to view our lives as something much, much bigger. And you know what's, what's interesting, this idea of, of a larger vision, a larger mission, you could say, is I read a story a few weeks ago. It's an awesome, awesome story that, that was just really encouraging to me. Um, but there's these two guys named Gunnar Ingalu, I think they're Swedish, and Niels Bolin. Okay, these two gentlemen can be credited for saving still today 15,000 people annually. Now, both of these men worked for the Swedish automobile manufacturer Volvo in the 1950s to 1970s. Gunnar was the CEO of Volvo, and he and Volvo itself, as they are today, was sort of obsessed with automobile safety. And they knew that the standard two-point seat belts, right? Students, you can ask your grandparents what those were like. But the two-point seat belts were not only terribly ineffective, but they were uncomfortable. And because of these, and because of these two-point seat belts, automobile fatalities were way too high. And so Gunner, the CEO, he brings in Niels Bolin and says, we have to create a safer, more effective seat belt. And so eventually in 1959, Niels Bolin, I think there's a picture of him, he creates the three-point seatbelt, which more or less looks just like the seatbelt that you will buckle up today, I hope, whenever you get in your car to go home, okay? Now here's what's crazy. These two men made a completely irrational and by all intensive purposes, bad business decision. You know what they did? They gave away this patent for free to any and every automobile competitor. Forbes magazine actually estimates that if they would have charged $10 per patent for every vehicle, they could have netted Volvo almost a half a billion dollars. But what leads two men to make such an irrational decision? I think it's because Niels Bolin and Gunnar Ingalu had a vision that far, far outreached just making Volvos safer. But instead, they wanted to know, how can we make automobiles? How can we make getting in a car to drop your kids off at school a safer experience? Not just for people who drive Volvos. They were compelled by a larger mission. They were compelled by a larger vision. And I think, I think when we look at the life of Joseph, I think we see a man who knew that what was coming from the womb of his fiance was bigger. It was bigger than his reputation. It was bigger than his former belief system, the Mosaic law. It was bigger than cultural norms. And he was willing to lay aside, Joseph was willing to lay aside his old ways so that he could remain faithful. And the life of Joseph calls us to a faithfulness and towards a vision that is bigger than our own. And when we encounter Jesus, we get to begin to view our lives as part of something much bigger. And I love this because I think it's precisely the acknowledgement that our lives are a small part 
of a larger story that we can begin to reorient and reprioritize our lives in such a way, right, that we no longer care about how do we just stay self-absorbed in our own little story, but instead, what can we do in our lives to be part of a larger vision, a larger mission, which is ultimately the narrative, the story of Jesus writing for his kingdom to come forth. Verse 23 continues. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, the word Emmanuel is used three times in Scripture. Okay, Isaiah 7, 14, which we just read again one chapter later in Isaiah 8, 8, and then right here in Matthew 1, 23. That's the only time you get the word Emmanuel. And I think it's fitting, and so we'll, we'll stop right there. We're going to come back to Emmanuel. But we have just entered what is called the first Sunday of Advent, okay? So Advent is four Sundays and some change, four weeks and some change before we reach Christmas. And now some of you might be more familiar with, with what Advent is, what the season of Advent is, maybe based on if you grew up in a little bit of a higher church tradition, but, but it's, it's nothing weird or crazy, I promise you that. But Advent is simply just a word that means arrival, right? Or, or the anticipation of an arrival. And so what we say when we are observing or when we are entering the season of Advent is that we are going to sort of step into, we are going to kind of allow ourselves and our heads to sort of reimagine what it would have been like for the Jewish people to wait 400 years for God to speak. At this point in Joseph's life, it has been four centuries, four, if not more, generations, probably a lot more than four generations, have gone by with never hearing the voice of God, right? And in the same way, we remember that not because we don't think God speaks to us or not because God takes like a four-week vacation from speaking to us during Advent, but it helps us reposture our lives and remember what it would have felt like to yearn for the Savior to come. And then it makes it all the more glorious when on Christmas Eve we get to proclaim joy to the world. He's back. Jesus has come to be with his people, right? And Joseph, what Joseph has just heard when he hears the angel say, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, is he hears that God, after 400 years, is breaking through and is coming back to be with his people. He's coming to be with his people. Not even a prophet. Can you imagine how excited they would have been just for a prophet? No, I'm sending myself. I'm sending my son to be with my people. And that's what we get to celebrate when we talk about Advent, when we talk about this time of year. And when we encounter the Lord, we can trust that just like he is Emmanuel, he is also Emmanuel, just like he was Emmanuel for Joseph, he is also Emmanuel for us. He is with us. And that includes in the silence, that includes in the brokenness, that includes in the weeks, the months, the years that seem to drag on forever. And, and you know, sometimes, I, I think in my own life at least, when, when we talk about this idea of God being with us, I think, well, if God is always with me, then I'm just supposed to always have like these weird, like warm, fuzzy feelings and almost seem like desensitized and detached from like anything bad that's actually happening. And I don't think that's the call. But God being with us, what it means, I heard Gary say this one time, and I think it's great. God being with us means that can Jesus calm the storm? Absolutely. Will he always calm the storm? I don't know. He certainly bestows the power to. But what he for sure will do, and what you can bank your faith on, is that since he is Emmanuel, he is going to be in that water waiting with us step by step. That's Emmanuel. That's God with us. And that's what we get to celebrate. Remember, remember, this is the same God, right, who when he grows up, and begins his ministry, he tells a parable about a shepherd leaving 99 of his sheep to go find the one. And what does he do when he finds the one? He joyfully, we overlook that word joyfully right there in that parable later on in Matthew. He joyfully scoops up that sheep, puts him over his shoulder, and carries him. I don't know how long, for as long as he needed to. 
because he's Emmanuel, because he's God with us. And that's what we get to celebrate. That's what Joseph is learning that his life is being intertwined to. Verse 24 and 25 continues. Y'all doing good? Do we need a seventh inning stretch break or anything? That'd be cool to try. I don't think Gary's here. We could do it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Verse 24 and 25 says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. And so what does Joseph do when he wakes up? What does Joseph do? He does exactly what the angel of the Lord commanded him to. Joseph didn't stop to contemplate anything. He didn't stop to think like, did I pick the wrong mushrooms from my garden last night and had a really weird trip and this, thought this angel dude was talking to me? No, he didn't stop to eat breakfast and think it over, right? He didn't even go to talk about it with his local rabbi or with some of his carpentry buddies, but instead he immediately pursued what the Lord had told him to do. The pace of Joseph is immediate. And I love this because you compare that to Zechariah, right? Who's John the Baptist's dad, who also has a similar encounter with an angel. Now, Zechariah is a priest, which is ironic too. And so he's in the temple and the angel Lord comes and basically says, hey, you and your wife are going to have a baby and you need to name him John the Baptist. And he's going to be the one that prepares the way for Joseph's kid, Jesus. And this is how Zechariah responds. Compare this to Joseph's response. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in her years. Zechariah, his immediate response is doubt. Joseph's immediate response is faithfulness. Joseph didn't, in this instance at least, he didn't need the proof, the rationale, or the reason that Zechariah did. But instead, Joseph, he trusted the voice of his God and he moved towards it immediately. And when we encounter Jesus, we pursue him immediately. Reminds me, uh, when, when I get home from work, typically we sort of have a storm door, and so my son Wells can usually see me walking up. And when he sees me walking up through that storm door, he almost always drops whatever he's doing, whatever he's playing with, some sort of truck, and he runs up to that screen door, that storm door, to see me walk in, right? And I think about that because in the same way, I kind of want to have the same response to my heavenly father. Whenever I hear God, whenever I see God moving in something, my automatic response is to drop whatever I'm doing and immediately move towards it, just like Joseph did. Immediately pursuing faithfulness and obedience. And you know, it really does make sense that this would be Jesus's earthly father, right? Especially when, when you sort of take time to consider the circle that Jesus would run with during his ministry years, right? It was not the religious or political elite, but instead it was, it was fishermen, tax collectors. I mean, in Acts 4.13, John and Peter, two of Jesus' disciples, are, are literally insulted as being called ordinary and unschooled men, right? But the difference, the difference for them, the difference for Joseph, maybe even the difference for us is we can be unordinary, unschooled men. But when we encounter Jesus, that changes everything. That changes everything. And when Joseph encountered Jesus, before Joseph even encountered Jesus outside the womb, it turned everything in his life upside down. It reoriented everything about his life. And if you think about it, Joseph was the first or one of the first who would have received the news that Jesus was going to be born unto an ordinary couple named Mary and Joseph. And if it weren't for what's happening here, none of us would have ever heard of them. They weren't a big deal. They were just kind of your average, young, engaged couple. And what's really fascinating is, is this was not the Messiah that Joseph would have been raised to be expecting, right? He and his Jewish brothers and sisters would have expected some sort of king political 
superstar that was going to come and save the world on some massive golden chariots and rain like fire, right? And, and Joseph and Mary, they didn't, they didn't live in a palace so unless things were going to change really quickly. Jesus wasn't going to be born in a palace. And you know how the story goes. He's born in a barn, right? And what's fascinating is really what those who first encountered Jesus were observing was that things were different. And part of what made them different is that in some ways on that night that Jesus was born, they were strikingly normal, if not below average accommodations. They had a nasty Airbnb and a stable, right? But this baby, this baby that we're celebrating this time of year, this is the kid, this is the child, the Messiah, that turns everything on its head, right? And brings forth an upside-down kingdom. And what's an upside-down kingdom? An upside-down kingdom is a kingdom that doesn't work the way other kingdoms work. Them play by the same rules, right? It's a, it's a kingdom that doesn't operate under traditional norms, okay? It's a kingdom that says to those whose society has traditionally picked last, no, 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 come to me, right? It's a kingdom that opposes the proud and yet welcomes the weak and the meek and the burden. And, and, and think about this, only in an upside down kingdom would it make sense for the Messiah to be birthed to ordinary people like Mary and Joseph instead of a king and a queen. In a stable instead of a palace, right? Only in an upside down kingdom would it make sense for the suffering servant to ride on a donkey to his brutal, gruesome death on a cross instead of a victorious, warrior-like, crushing all other human governments and becoming this sort of superpower, superstar God. But this isn't an ordinary king. And it certainly isn't an ordinary kingdom. There's a song that came out a couple years ago called Baby Son. It's by this um, artist named John Mark McMillan. And this song came out two years ago. And I just want to read you the lyrics. Because if, if, there's, if there's a lyric outside of, of course, scripture that can encapsulate what it means to be part of an upside down kingdom, it's this right here. So listen to this. We thought you'd come with a crown of gold, a string of pearls and a cashmere robe. We thought you'd clinch an iron fist and rain like fire on the politics. But without a sword, no armored guard, but common born in mother's arms, the government now rests upon the shoulders of the baby son. Here's the deal. His upside down kingdom replaced force and violence with compassion and grace, right? And when, when the religion of his ancestors had grown stale and regulated, Jesus replaces it with life and relationship with God. When Roman culture became oppressive and subversive, he responds, Jesus responds by replacing it with an upside down way of doing things and says, no, 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 no. You guys have got it all wrong. It's about caring for the poor. It's about generosity. It's about the marginalized. It's about the outcast. It's about seeing things with an upside down perspective. In Acts 17, I'll read this really quick, but uh, Paul and Silas were in Thessalonica and, and they caused some trouble as, as many of the apostles often did and, and they can't find him and so they bring Jason in and this is how the city officials uh, respond or this is what they say that these men have done. Look at this in Acts 17. And when they cannot find them, they drag Jason and some of their brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Those who encounter Jesus, we begin to see things upside down. And we begin to turn the world upside down. But it all starts with an encounter. And when we encounter Jesus, we begin to reorient our lives, our beliefs, our rhythms, what we value, what we spend our money on, where we spend our time, our status, suddenly these things take on new meaning. In an upside down 
kingdom, we're okay to be the Jesse Hyman of the kingdom and extra because we are part of the only kingdom that will ever withstand the test of time and eventually will reign supreme over all other worldly and earthly kingdoms. So heck yeah, we'll be an extra in this kingdom. Give me Jesse Hyman all day if I get to be part of the kingdom. And when you encounter God, he turns everything upside down, right? And here's the beauty. Here's the beauty of this baby. The good news of what we celebrate at Christmas is that there is a real kingdom and friends, it is an upside down kingdom. Don't expect it to work like the other kingdoms of this world. And that's because the king of this kingdom is an upside down king named Jesus. And in fact, it's so upside down that this king, he was the one that went and died on a cross for your death, for your death as the peasants. What other kingdoms does the king die for the peasants? I don't know of one because there's not one. And all you have to do is repent, believe, and follow him. And you can be part of this upside down kingdom. And so as we close out, if we're to encounter Jesus this season, what in your life do you need to allow to be turned upside down? Is it your budget? Is it your time? Is it a bitterness that you've set on for too long? Is it a sin that has plagued you for too long? Because here's the thing. You, when you were made new in Christ, right? When you respond to the gospel, you were rewired. You were rewired. And, and part of the way in which you were rewired is now you live for some upside down ideas. Things like grace and experiencing grace and helping others experience grace. Gathering, right? Gathering like this. And you kind of know where I'm going with this. Growing, giving, going. And this is not just some uh, shameless plug of our five Gs. No one told me I needed to talk about the five Gs, but the reality is, is that when we're made new with Christ, we are rewired. Our hardwiring inside us is replaced with new ways of doing things. And the world might view those things as upside down, but really when it comes to life with God, it's exactly how he designed it. But here's the tension. Many of us try and live upright lives in an upside down kingdom and we get spiritually dizzy and exhausted and that's no way to live. You feel a tension there. You feel a tension there. It's as if your body is operating in a way that it was not designed to do and that's because that's exactly what's happening, right? And so what is it? What is it that you need to lay down and let God reorient and ultimately turn upside down in your life. Because when Joseph encountered Jesus, he saw the world upside down. And in the same way, when we encounter Jesus, we will live upside down lives in an upside down kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you um, that we get to celebrate uh, you coming to be with your people, Lord. Being Emmanuel. And Father, we also acknowledge right now that you will come back again. And when you come back next time, Lord, things are going to be different. Because that upside down kingdom is going to suddenly be the only kingdom, Lord. And Father, as much as we long and yearn and crave that day, Lord, Father, we also know that until that day comes, Father, the call for all of us is to live upside down lives, even in a world that doesn't like the way we live, even in a world that doesn't see or prioritize things the way that you do, Lord. And so, Father, help us like Joseph to be faithful, Lord, to be faithful and to pursue whatever it is that you have called us towards. We love you. Praise in your name. Amen.